Hi, I'm Jeff. Uh, this talk is about uh, talking about identity, authentication, authorization, all the way from Kubernetes to the cloud provider and back. There's a lot of material to get through, so let's just jump right in, try to keep this zippy so we can get through the afternoon lull. Um, the agenda today is uh, to talk about the relationship between Kubernetes and I'm going to talk about AWS because that's what I'm most familiar with, but these principles apply to uh, all the cloud, major cloud providers as well. Um, there are a lot of moving parts uh, between identity authorization in Kubernetes and their equivalents in the cloud. So we'll talk through some of those components. Um, I would like to also talk about what this N10 framework opens up as far as potential vulnerabilities and attack paths. And then so that we don't end on a sad note, we'll talk about some tools and strategies you can use to secure your uh, Kubernetes and, and cloud provider source. Um, so the first question is, why well, I care about this. Uh, increasingly, Kubernetes is your cloud. If you run uh, workloads, if you run stateful workloads on Kubernetes, um, this Kubernetes, in many senses, uh, is your cloud, especially once you get into things like running cross-plane on Kubernetes, you can directly uh, affect your cloud. Um, so this is a primary entry point, and for, I would say, given uh, certain styles of running engineering departments in organizations, Kubernetes may be the primary entry point to the cloud for developers. Um, so here's kind of a high-level overview of the end-to-end -end flow. This is a complex process, uh, somewhat simplified here. I won't dwell too long on this uh, so we can get into the individual components. But broadly speaking, you'll have some uh, users or workloads trying to interact with the Kubernetes API, uh, which then performs some authorization mechanism to understand what they're allowed to do within the cluster. And then, depending on the workload, it may try to interact with some cloud resource. So then there's uh, then some cloud interaction as well. So we'll talk through this. Um, this is a simplified version of what we just saw, but I just wanted to represent it this way so we can focus our discussion on credentials, configuration, and then resources. Um, these are all separate areas for us to focus on and keep in mind when trying to secure uh, our workloads and how uh, users interact with these workloads. But of course, they all interact with each other. Uh, this will just be help us organize how we uh, talk about this, because especially credentials, as we get later into the talk and talk about these attack vectors, uh, securing these and thinking about what actually has access to our cluster is going to be important. Um, so authentication. Uh, hopefully this is familiar to many of you, but just to set a baseline for everyone. Um, there are many ways of authenticating with the Kubernetes API. A client will make a request to the Kubernetes API, and then whether it presents bearer tokens or client certs, uh, when you're spinning up the cluster and uh, you know, new nodes are being created using bootstrap token or, or other means, uh, there will be uh, a variety of mechanisms that we need to think about when we're thinking about securing these clusters. Uh, just to take a quick look at client certs, for example, um, every Kubernetes cluster has a certificate authority, and they can be used to issue client certs. Uh, we can bind these to a context for a user that when they interact with the Kubernetes API, you can present that certificate to authenticate against the cluster, and then, as we will talk later, uh, get authorization to perform certain actions. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is, again, depending on how the organization is set up, this means one more thing to secure. There are certs uh, on uh, some engineer's laptop or uh, possibly some CI CD system that's uh, interacting with the cluster. Um, but I would say for purposes of this talk, the, the most common use case we're going to talk about is bearer tokens, uh, specifically uh, authenticating with your cloud provider, um, usually taking the form of uh, JSON web tokens. Uh, just as a quick aside, for the most part, we will be talking about OIDC. Uh, there are still some, several use cases that uh, use SAML. Um, broadly speaking, OIDC is considered the more modern means of doing things. It's, uh, it's JSON, so it's nice. Uh, it plays better with APIs. But um, there are still use cases that uh, require SAML. And um, uh, you will find certain industries that uh, just prefer it in general. Like, for example, federal agencies, you will find often use SAML more. Um, so, Everything we've talked about so far has been more or less oriented towards users. How do users interact with the cluster? What effects that could have downstream to the cloud provider? But when we talk about workloads, primarily we're talking about machine users or service accounts. 
Um, these are the, the primary mechanism for system components. Um, and just to talk through what the request lifecycle looks like, whether it's a user or a machine user, uh, whether it's kubectl or even a kubelet or controller manager or scheduler, all, all go through this flow, interacting with Kubernetes API, go through the authentication mechanism, which we've already talked about. Then there's the authorization step, which determines what permissions this identity has to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. Um, then there's admission control, which is the opportunity for uh, the cluster to validate, possibly modify, inject environment variables, use policies to check to make sure that the, the manifest or the API request that's being submitted is valid. Uh, and then finally, schema validation to make sure that what is being submitted is well formed before being admitted into the cluster. Um, so finally, this is the hopefully more interesting part uh, of the talk. Uh, speaking of authorization, what, what does this entail? Um, Authorization at its uh, kind of easiest to understand level is who can perform what function on what resource. So we talked about users. We talked about uh, system. Uh, it's a, a lot of the things you see here, like for example, if I had a user registered in Kubernetes directly, or some of the, the built-in users uh, for Kubernetes, um, there are a series of verbs that you can specify. We will talk through some of those a little bit more in detail later because some of them are a little bit surprising in terms of what they can do and how these can be exploited. But uh, these can be assigned and then those can be assigned one or more in any combination with certain resources, whether that's workloads, secrets, config maps, et cetera. Uh, so just uh, very briefly to, to recap, when a client is interacting with the Kubernetes API, uh, it is posting some information that specifies these subject verbs and resources, uh, which and very and depending on whether it's a namespaced resource or a cluster-wide resource, that will also be used to uh, constrain this. Um, so, just to review what this looks like in terms of manifests, uh, when you have a service account that needs to interact with Kubernetes, you will provision your service account. You will create a role that, as we talked about, gives verbs to access certain resources within the cluster, and then you'll bind them together to enable that service account to uh, interact and operate on those resources. Um, just as a, a word of caution, as with anything else, whether it's cloud or Kubernetes, you can stack these rules, you can have multiple bindings, and it becomes increasingly difficult to reason about uh, what the, the blast radius of a particular identity is in Kubernetes. So we'll talk later about some tools that can help reason about this. But just as a visual representation, it's a little hard to read here, but you can see uh, we have a user here that's bound to uh, many different roles. And then at the bottom, uh, again, take my word for it, <laughs> uh, you can see that it basically has the full spectrum of permissions, even if each of these individual roles was well scoped. Um, so just something to keep in mind when you're reviewing your, your permissions. Um, so, uh, Way in the past, you know, the, the quick and dirty way of accessing things is to provision a, a cloud user uh, and get an access key in secret and just give that to some workload. You're off to the races. Uh, not good. Uh, that, that opens uh, a lot of potentials for uh, any time credentials are created, they can be exfiltrated potentially. So uh, the, the modern and preferred way of doing this is through IAM rules for service accounts or URSA. Um, this, this is how it looks. Uh, you will provision some IAM role in uh, AWS, and then annotate your service account with the IAM role that it is allowed to uh, assume. Um, and then once that service account is available, you can mount that uh, service account on your workload by, by specifying the service account name. Um, and if you're, uh, some things we're about to talk about will be taken care of automatically in the background depending on the tools they use, but I just want to mentioned explicitly um, that there, there has been a tool over the, the previous several years called Kiam. You also may be familiar with uh, Cube 2 IAM. Uh, these are still out there in the wild. Broadly speaking, they achieve the same thing. The underlying mechanisms are slightly different, but uh, it's, it's the same considerations when it comes to security and things to think about uh, for, for these, uh, these authorization mechanisms. So not to get too deep into the details, but uh, 
Uh, as we just talked about, when you're arranging this, you will provision some IAM role that, that has some policy attached to it. Uh, you'll have some service account that you want to be able to assume that role. And then you need to establish a trust policy, uh, which enables ex uh, identities that are external to the cloud to assume these roles. As I said, if you're using a tool like EKS CTL, uh, it will do this in the background for you. But just to be explicit for, for what this is doing, you, you will see here uh, what this is essentially doing is allowing this identity to uh, uh, perform this action, STS assume role, with web identity, which we will revisit later. But th this is the underlying mechanism for how service accounts can start to interact with the cloud. Um, so just to talk through this in, again, one level deeper, and, and this will be, I think, the deepest that we go. Uh, when you submit a workload to the API server, there's an identity webhook. We talked about the, the API request lifecycle. The identity webhook will examine a workload that you are submitting, see if there's service accounts attached to it, see if the, that service account is annotated. And if it is, then it will perform all these magical actions on the right, which is uh, basically translating that annotated service account so that it can inject these environment variables on the workload so that when the uh, workload uh, uses the AWS SDK to make a request to cloud resources, these environment variables will be available to that SDK. And again, we talked about uh, the STS uh, assume uh, role um, in the trust policy, and that's what this uh, web identity token file is going to be used for, and then the role ARN is the role that it would like to assume. So just to note one last thing, you'll notice as part of this process, the uh, webhook has mounted this volume with a token on the workload. Uh, as with anything else, when there's a token, that means the token could be stolen. <laughs> so just to keep in mind, uh, this is there. And, and together with this information can, can be uh, a bit dangerous should a, a malicious third party get access to these things. Um, so just to, on a higher level, now that we have all this information, how does this work in practice? Well, you have your workload. We talked about the AWS role ARN, the role that it would like to assume, the token that's mounted on the pod. Uh, when the workload would like to interact with the cloud resource, let's say S3 in this case, um, it will uh, send to STS uh, with the assume role with web identity command, that token and ARN. STS will uh, validate that request and then pass the token onto IAM for final validation. Um, the, the IAM role, uh, the IAM, after validating this, will check that the role is associated with the correct policy to be able to interact with that resource. And then when everything checks out, we'll ultimately forward back temporary credentials to the workload that are time limited in, in a number of hours. This is configurable, but generally speaking, a matter of hours to be able to interact with that cloud resource. So after that validation cycle, the pod has the necessary credentials to be able to interact directly with the resource. The bridge between Kubernetes and the cloud has been established. Um, one more mechanism to talk about. We've talked primarily about going from Kubernetes to the cloud. There's also the reverse that happens. We talked before about users, for example, using kubectl interacting with Kubernetes. And if they use AWS SSO login or some other means of, uh, of authenticating with an identity provider, how the mechanism through which that external identity is mapped back into Kubernetes permissions is through this AW auth config map that is uh, created um, in EKS. Uh, this, is, this is close to what it looks like on just a default AWS uh, config map. But you can imagine uh, if you have provisioned users, if you have specialized roles that, might, for example, might be viewer only, only able to interact with certain resources, or kind of full-blown ad, uh, cluster admins, uh, it will use this to map back to enable those users to uh, use the correct uh, permissions and, and operate on the right resources. Um, one note is that while I will get to vulnerabilities in a moment, but while there aren't that many vulnerabilities that have been discovered out in the wild regarding this config map, it is possible to incorrectly edit this config map and basically break Kubernetes, you know, your EKS cluster. So, uh, when operating on this, uh, generally speaking, use uh, tools. Uh, try not to do it manually. <laughs> um, so again, uh, we, we saw this image before. Hopefully, you have a better idea of the various components of this. 
uh, identities on the left interacting uh, to get a Kubernetes uh, uh, permission set. And then depending on the, the, the process involved, possibly further trying to get access to AWS resources and getting permissions to interact with those AWS resources as well. Um, so now is the fun part. Let's talk about some vulnerabilities. Uh, there, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of moving parts here. The internal Kubernetes moving parts and the cloud moving parts. So we'll start with the Kubernetes stuff. Um, there are a lot of different verbs that you can assign to different workloads. Uh, I think what is obvious to many people is trying to lock down your secrets and who can view those secrets. But even things that might appear on the surface to be more benign, like the ability to create a pod or update a pod, uh, are also potentially dangerous depending on um, what the what the actor is trying to do. So for example, if you have the ability to create a pod, you may be able to uh, provide host path access to that pod. And that provides the workload with the means to access the underlying node's file system. So if there are tokens or uh, cube config files or anything else on that system, that particular workload may not have anything particularly bad. But it now has the ability to hunt for things laterally that other workloads mounted on the same node may have. Um, just as a quick example, there were some crypto miners who exploited some of this to uh, uh, create uh, crypto mining apps. They used some of this to mount volumes with uh, privilege because they had the ability to create pods. And then they escaped the containers so that they could mine directly on the under underlying uh, nodes. Um, and uh, this, this was something that uh, it was, it's kind of funny because uh, these two crypto miners were actually competing, competing with each other, coming in and then deleting the other, uh, the other actors' deployments that they could monopolize the resources to mine more. Um, the next one is something I think is surprising to some people, which is normally when you think about protecting secrets, you think about being able to get the secret. I want to get the secret, and then uh, it's base64 decoded by default, uh, decoded, and then use the secret. But even the ability to list or watch secrets um, can expose the values of the secrets in a namespace. So again, something to keep in mind. Uh, another obvious uh, catch is wildcard resource verb. Do not use star or try to limit your use of star on verbs, being able to do everything to a resource or being able to do something to any resource. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, again, another, if you, can, if you can create rule bindings or, uh, or patch rule bindings, then that means you can elevate uh, privileges. Um, so this is just an example. It, again, it's hard to read, I'm sorry, but uh, of the, the list secrets. If you try to get the secret and you don't have permissions, you may get a forbidden response. But if you list the secrets in the namespace, uh, I've redacted it there, but it will reveal the values. Um, there was another case where uh, kubefs is a, file, uh, a storage and file system uh, 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 protocol, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, mechanism. For Kubernetes, that's popular with ML and, and data science workloads. Um, there was a, a CVE a while back where uh, kubefs uh, deploys as a daemon set, and the daemon set had cluster roles. Uh, and so a cluster role that had the ability to list secrets, which, as we just discussed, uh, potentially exposed secrets across the, the board for anything that compromised the, the daemon set. Um, this is, uh, again, th this touches on a few things. Number one, there may be access into your cluster that you don't normally think of, like through an observability tool like the Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, this is one reason, one more reason to use URSA instead of during AWS uh, access keys and secrets because uh, it, you know, it was exposed here. But uh, again, thinking holistically in terms of how to secure a cluster and how people might get access to these credentials is important. Um, something I just want to quickly mention, EC2 instance metadata service. Kubelet interact with EC2 instances through this service that is uh, link local. So you can just call some, uh, some URL and get an instance profile uh, with AWS credentials to be able to interact with the node. And V1, it was just straight permission. Anyone with uh, ac local access could access this and get these credentials. Generally speaking, it, it was only to access the underlying nodes. But again, there are still things you can do when you have access to the nodes. So AWS introduced a V2 version of this that uses session authentication. Uh, V1 still exists by default, so you have to go in and 
purposefully disable it to, to kind of close this loophole, but I just wanted to call it out because uh, Scarly Deal, which was a, a crypto mining operation that also uh, did some did exfiltration side work, uh, took advantage of this uh, IMDS v1 uh, exploitability. So just to keep in mind that this is still out there, be conscious of it. Thank you. Um, just a, a couple more things. Uh, I'll just run through this really quick. Uh, the, there are a couple of things to keep in mind, like even your workloads, if they're not configured well, uh, if there can be a remote code execution to extract these secrets, we already talked about tokens are mounted, environment variables are injected. Uh, there are ways to exfiltrate this data if, uh, if these remote code executions uh, exist and the, the pod has the ability to read files. Uh, and then on the other side of this, uh, there's the so-called server-side request forgery. For those not familiar, this is a means by which you can force a server to make an API call that it normally wouldn't necessarily do. And again, through exploiting this, you might be able to call IMDS or, or interact with the Kubernetes API and extract these credentials. Um, I'll skip this since we're running out of time. Um, I, I am sorry to mention this, but just because it's been in the news recently, uh, we talked about OIDC and authentication. That can be another attack vector. So uh, unfortunately, Okta had some issues recently. But if you have users that are authenticating through these third-party vector uh, providers, it's something to keep in mind. Um, and then, yeah, so again, talked about this just to emphasize a lot of moving parts, a lot to uh, cover. Um, then as, as far as tools to keep in mind, um, here's a list. Uh, sorry, it's a bit kitchen sink. But the, uh, the one I want to highlight the most is the top one, because this can get very hard to reason about with all these roles and permissions. Um, AWS has a tool called Access Analyzer that will actually look at your audit logs to determine what you're actually using. So if you have over-provisioned roles, it will help you right-size those roles. And then there are a bunch of other tools that can help you reason about inside Kubernetes, what your RBAC policies are, who can do what. Um, and then as a last line of defense, uh, some things that slip through the cracks, new vulnerabilities are coming up all the time. It's important to review audit logs to determine uh, who is doing what in your cluster so you are familiar with patterns of access. What is abnormal? Are people accessing things outside of normal hours? Are people accessing things they've never accessed before? Things that, you know, are they granted new permissions that they didn't have before? Um, very important to do. Uh, so just to recap, in summary, uh, there's no magic bullet here. Uh, this is all about defense in depth. Uh, we mentioned some of the techniques here. Uh, some, something I didn't mention before, if you have a workload that doesn't need to interact with the Kubernetes API, it's just like a, a running something, um, don't mount the service account token. So you can explicitly disable that. Uh, you can also use the network boundary to try to limit access. If someone penetrates and gets these credentials, they just cannot escape Kubernetes to actually interact with those AWS resources. Uh, finally, as we talked about, principles of least privilege, right sizing to make sure that your rules are not over permissioned. And again, uh, review your audit logs, review your audit logs, stay vigilant. Thank you. Any questions? All right, does anybody have any questions? All right, going once, going twice. All right, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone.